So I commend you guys for coming out and spending two days to think about energy, about climate change. I think these are the uh, central issues of our time, probably the central issues of the next three or four decades, five decades, six decades, maybe the entire century. Uh, I want to start with a brief parable. About six weeks ago, uh, two residents of Salt Lake City, Thomas Garner and his wife, Tamitha, drove down to photograph some wild horses in Nevada. They drove to Cedar City and then they went west. They got in a blizzard. They got stuck. Their Dodge Dakota came to a halt in a big snow drift. They were stranded. Some of you have read this story. They had maybe 10 gallons of gasoline in the pickup. They had some food they had bought. And they practiced radical energy conservation. And 12 days later, they walked out alive. They stayed with the pickup for nine days. They were in no hurry to get off of oil. They were not worried about their carbon footprint. They were eating granola bars and running the engine for brief periods of time to stay warm. When they were down to two granola bars and some dog food, Tamitha suggested that maybe it was time to start walking. Her husband, who was an Eagle Scout, remembered seeing on TV that you could take the seat cushions out of a vehicle and turn them into snowshoes. He strapped the seat cushions to his feet with bungee cords and they walked for three days. They had a lighter and they had some carburetor cleaner. They used the carburetor cleaner to start fires at night. They slept under trees. And when they met a snowplow on day 12, after everyone had given them up for dead, they were in fine form. The relatives said this was a miracle, but I don't think this was due to divine intervention. I think these two people practiced a kind of energy intelligence. They passed an energy IQ test that is similar in many respects to what the nation faces today. We live in an amazing time in human history. Um, I think we Americans really do not fully understand how blessed we are to be alive right now. A typical American motorist drives 12,000 miles each year. It's like driving the distance to the moon every 20 years. The best visual metaphor for our civilization, I would argue, is the space shuttle. We've got 300 million people on board. We're rocketing along, hauling ass, living in a way that no human beings have ever lived before. And the space shuttle, these three engines on the space shuttle, these main space shuttle engines, each one of them is 10 times more powerful than Glen Canyon Dam. The energy consumption in our civilization right now is staggering. It's a million British thermal units per person per day. That's the energy equivalent of 100 pounds of coal, eight gallons of gasoline, 1,000 cubic feet of natural gas, or one lightning bolt's worth of energy per person per day. That's what we see out there. A typical automobile engine or snowmobile engine is eight times more powerful than the most powerful machine on the planet 200 years ago. We take this for granted. We take it as normal. It's anything but normal. It's the most magical period in human history. One of my favorite writers is a guy named Lauren Isley, and he wrote that man's long adventure with knowledge has been a climb up the heat ladder. The creature that crept fur through the glitter of blue glacial nights now lives surrounded by the hiss of steam and the roar of engines, and he is himself aflame, a great roaring furnace. This is our story. This is our journey. For most of human history, we've been farming the sun. There are many ways you can do that. You can do it by planting rice, as this woman is in Vietnam. You can do it by fishing the open ocean. You can do it by grazing cattle and sheep. You can do it by hunting bison on the Great Plains. You can do it the way the first Mormons did when they got here uh, 150 years ago. That's a different world. It's a world that still exists out there. We call it the third world or the undeveloping world, undeveloped world. It's a world in which all the work is being done by muscle power, not by machines. We have 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 machines in a typical American house. In this old world, 
all the work was done by muscle power, either that of domesticated animals or if you talk to anthropologists, they'll tell you that women historically have done 75% of the work in most cultures. Now, this tradition of women doing most of the work uh, <clears throat> is alive and well. Every few centuries, some men show up that are interested in doing work, and we had a whole bunch of them about 100 years ago. Uh, Edison, Ford, Westinghouse, Tesla, you know their names. These guys are the Wright brothers. So this is just a century ago, 1905. Human beings had never flown. Most people thought we never would fly. The Wright brothers never went to college. They were bicycle mechanics. Read a biography of them, fascinating guys. But in the space of three years, they unlocked this very difficult, dangerous problem of how you preserve dynamic stability in flight. And they did it without getting killed. This is 1905. They had never flown above water before. So they've strapped a canoe onto the bottom of this plane. <laughs> now they built everything on this plane. They designed it. They hand stitched the muslin on these wings. They built the engine for this plane upstairs in the bicycle shop. They did it all themselves. And we call this Yankee ingenuity. American history unrolls thereafter through aeronautical images. This is 1927. Lindbergh flies the open Atlantic. He's up in the air for 30 hours. He has five sandwiches. He flies at 10,000 feet above the ocean. He goes down to 10 feet above the ocean. He has trouble staying awake. He lands in Paris. He's met by 100,000 people on the runway. And overnight, he becomes the world's first global celebrity. And I think the reason is, is he demonstrated for the first time that human beings could live like gods. Amelia, 10 years later, tries to fly around the world, makes it three quarters of the way. She vanishes in the Pacific. She remains a heroine to many generations of young American women today. She lived like a god. DIA, this blew me away. This is Denver International Airport, which is now the 10th busiest airport in the world. As recently as 1975, 80% of Americans had never flown commercially on a jet aircraft. Uh, this year, 8 million flights will carry 600 million passengers each year. So in a century, we've gone from a time when no man or woman had ever flown to a moment in human history now where every man is Lindbergh and every woman is Amelia. We're living like gods, and like gods, we have large footprints. And you guys have spent a day and a half talking about carbon footprints. Today, globally, we'll put 80 million tons of this long-lived greenhouse gas into the air. Typical American family puts about 45,000 pounds each year, more than 100 pounds a day, half of it from operating their home and half of it from driving their vehicles. This is a graph of carbon emissions from 1756 on the left when James Watt invented the steam engine to contemporary times on the right here. And uh, you guys have probably been obsessing. You've seen other graphs yesterday probably similar to this. Uh, orange is deforestation at the bottom. Purple is fossil fuel consumption. Half of the CO2 we put into the air, we put into the air in the last 25 years. So let me say that again. Half of all the carbon dioxide human beings have produced in their history has been produced in the last two and a half decades. This is why the warming has been so rapid and so noticeable uh, to the man on the street. Now, you can obsess about emissions, and I've spent 20 years doing that. I wrote my first article on climate change in 1987. I talked about retreating glaciers, fires, drought, insects, endangered species, all that stuff. It seemed like science fiction then. It's all come true. But look at this another way. What this represents is a phenomenal plume of pollution from what I've come to call the big bonfire. If half of all the CO2 people have produced, we've produced in the last 25 years, then that goes, flip side of that is that half of all the fossil fuels human beings have ever consumed, we've consumed since 1980. 
Now, we've already warmed the world enough that many hydrologists think that Lake Powell and Lake Mead will never fill again. And if we continue on our current course, it's inevitable that we will redraw the map of Florida over the next, uh, this, this would probably be inevitable by, this might take 200 years to happen, but this will be inevitable if we continue on that same course that you saw a moment ago in terms of CO2 emissions. But there's an interesting embedded question in here that has not received enough scrutiny in my view. It's how much fuel do we actually have to burn? It's a given among climatologists that carbon is no problem. They argue that we have tons and tons and billions and billions and billions of tons of all kinds of fossil fuels and that it's inevitable we will burn them unless we have strong climate policy. I believe that for 20 years. I'm becoming less certain of it as every day passes. Here's the big bonfire electricity growth in three different nations since 1990. Chuck showed you a slide where emissions now are above the worst case. That's largely due to China doubling its coal burn in the space of six years from the year 2000 to the year 2006. Can this continue? Can the big bonfire continue to get bigger, rage hotter? We hear a lot about the Chinese building one power plant a week or one power plant every 10 days and we wring our hands and we say, oh my God, here's a four year look at new power plants in the US, one power plant every 10 days between 2001 and 2005. We're adding on to the space shuttle 30 million Americans every decade. Population growth is another thing that's rarely discussed at climate meetings. It's absolutely essential that we think about it and what it means. We're at 300 million now. We're headed to 400 million by 2030. So let's take a quick survey of fossil fuels. They provide 85% of the world's energy, as you heard yesterday. Oil provides 40% of the world's energy. When the GIs came home from the war, in 1945, the whole world was running on 10 million barrels a day. Two-thirds of it was produced here in the U.S. Between 1950 and the year 2000, we had an eight-fold expansion in global oil production. This is the period of time in which you and I were raised, and it's the period in time that we think of as normal, and historians will think of as the most exceptional period in many respects in human history. In that period of time, we were drowning in inexpensive, inexpensive oil, $2 oil, $4 oil, $10 oil. We built a whole civilization around it. We built suburbia around it. We built our agricultural systems around it. It's what enabled Las Vegas. It's what enables you and I to live like Lindbergh and Amelia. Um, and the challenge now is that the $20 oil of the 1990s is gone and not coming back. And we're in a world of $100 oil, probably headed to a world of $150 or $200 oil within 15 years. So we've designed a whole civilization that is in danger in certain respects of falling off the heat ladder, I would argue. This, I love this ad because I think it encapsulates that period. What is this, a 56 Chevy, somebody 57? One of you guys would know here. 57. I beg your pardon, so, which proves my point. We, <laughs> look, I once drove a pickup truck to Patagonia, so I'm not, I, but, but I want to, I want to get to your hearts a minute here about this. Look at this woman. Look at her face. What is the feeling there? What are we selling here? Not only as cigarettes, but we're selling hamburgers and french fries and milkshakes and fast food and rollerblades and ample bosom with a side dose of lung cancer. <laughs> We're selling the American dream, but now look more seriously at her face. Human beings have wanted perpetual motion for our entire history, and in the last 50 years we have found it. There is a feeling of liberation and freedom and pleasure on this woman's face that is very real. This is a graph of U.S. oil production from 1900 on the left to the year 2000 to 2050 over here. 
you can see that our domestic production peaked in 1970. We're now consuming our body weight in petroleum each week here in the United States, 140 pounds per person per week. You can see that since it peaked in 1970, about two-thirds of all the oil that will ever be produced in this country has already been consumed. I was giving a talk in Oklahoma. I wanted to make sure everyone understood what it means when two-thirds of something is gone. <laughs> I haven't tried telling that joke in Oklahoma yet, but um, <laughs> this, this is our petroleum dilemma. We have to share these remaining two cans. If you think of all the oil that will ever be produced in this country as a six-pack, four of the cans are gone, we have to share these remaining two amongst all future generations of Americans. You read about these countries every day in the newspaper, five countries around the Persian Gulf. Every green blotch on this map is a large, giant oil field. We found two in North America. There are 40 of them here. It's an accident of geology. It's a petroleum dilemma. It's not just a dilemma for the Americans. It's a dilemma for the French and the Germans, eventually the Mexicans who will stop exporting oil within 10 or 15 years. It's a dilemma for the Japanese and the Taiwanese, and above all, for the Chinese. It's a human dilemma. You know what a trouble, troubled area this is. I'm not going to, you know, we, we don't need to talk about this. We've been reading about it year after year. We fought two wars here in the last 15 years. We've got 140,000 troops on the ground right now in Iraq. You all know what's happening over in that part of the world. The large red blotch here is the world's largest gas field. So what we see is that both oil and natural gas, its cousin, are very, uh, they're ill distributed. They're concentrated in certain parts of the world and there's none of them in other parts. The US was blessed with an amazing fossil fuel heritage, coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, uh, <laughs> So let me talk about natural gas a minute. How much natural gas do we have to burn? Again, the climatologists would argue that, oh, the world is drowning in natural gas. I don't believe it. Um, here's the deal. We're heating most of the buildings in the U.S. with natural gas today. Half of the natural gas we'll use today, 80 billion cubic feet, is coming, half of it, is coming from wells that are less than three years old. Flip it around. In the next three years, we have to replace with new drilling or LNG imports more than half of the natural gas we'll use today. Astonishing to me. This is a, you know, this is an eye exam, I guess. I don't know, but um, this, this is important. This is two-thirds of U.S. oil. It's probably a laser pointer somewhere, but this is two-thirds of U.S. oil production. Each color here represents one year's worth of drilling. So here we are in the year 2000. We're getting, this is two-thirds of all the natural gas we'll produce in that year. By the year 2008, all of those wells effectively die. And you can see that the depletion curve is getting steeper as time goes on. Natural gas is our cleanest fossil fuel. It's a wonderful fuel. A lot of, uh, you know, clean energy advocates have always called for, let's, let's go to natural gas. Let's run our cars and our power plants on natural gas. You know, let's turn away from coal. Let's, let's just use natural gas. One of the big challenges we face as Americans, I would argue, is a software challenge. It's a cultural challenge. It's been called the frontier mentality. It was on display at this drilling rig out in western Colorado. It said, Earth first, we will drill the other planets later. <laughs> we, we bring this. Because North America was loaded up like a pinata, we have a very powerful frontier mentality. It's part of our genius, and I would argue with respect to climate change and energy policy, it's a huge handicap. As Westerners, we know something about limits, uh, my forebears were Mormons. I've lived in the arid west all my life. 
I understand limits somewhere in my bones. Let's go to the third fossil fuel, which is coal. When you begin reading about climate change, you'll hear time and time again, this is a coal dilemma. This is a coal problem. You'll read that there's 10 times more coal underground than there is vegetation above ground. You'll read that if we run out of oil and natural gas, we can turn coal into liquid fuels, into natural gas, into any darn thing we want. You'll read that the Chinese are getting 70% of all their primary energy comes from coal and that they and the Americans produce and burn more than half of the world's 6 billion tons a year. A Wyoming politician 100 years ago said that Wyoming boasts enough coal to weld every tie that binds, drive every wheel, change the North Pole into a tropical region, or smelt all hell. This is an accurate statement. <laughs> Wyoming and China together now are mining half of the world's coal. Every time you burn a ton of coal, the carbon in the coal combines with oxygen in the air to give you two tons of CO2, which is why when you buy $100 worth of electricity, every time you send Utah Power and light 100 bucks uh, for electricity, they're giving you, in addition to the juice, which is wonderful and desirable, they're giving you about 1,800 pounds of carbon dioxide, some of which will still be in the atmosphere 100 years from now. Now, the conventional wisdom among all the climatologists and most of the environmentalists and most of the energy people is that carbon to burn available global fossil fuel reserves are not a problem. And this is another eye exam. I encourage you to come back and look at this chart later on in the, you know, online. But I just want to make a couple of points here. In the whole history of the human race, we've burned about 350, we put about 350 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere. The climatologists are saying, well, there's what, 10 times, 12 times that in coal. There's maybe twice that in natural gas. These are global. And maybe twice or three times that in oil, both conventional oil and unconventional oil. There's some recent work that calls all of this into question. I'm going to play devil's advocate in the last few minutes of my talk here because I want you to understand that I used to think we would have effective climate policy in the US. I used to think that maybe we would get a treaty with the Chinese and the Indians. Look, we can't even talk, stop the slaughter in Darfur, Sudan right now. We haven't solved the Palestinian problem. We're barely rebuilding New Orleans. And this idea that we're going to strike a grand global international treaty to reduce carbon dioxide emissions seems to me, the older I get, um, unlikely. Now, that's not to say that we're not going to solve the climate problem because I think we are, but I think we're going to do it for different reasons than we have been thinking we're going to do it. Recent work by a guy named Dave Rutledge, you can see a one hour video online, he's a Caltech professor, just Google this, the coal question. He argues that there's maybe a fifth or a sixth as much economic coal as contrasted with coal reserves as we've come to believe. You had this accident here, Crandall Canyon. When you go down and you talk to the mine operators down there around Helper, where Utah's historically mined most of its coal, they'll tell you flat out, this part of the state is becoming depleted. You're down to 2,000 feet, some of the deepest coal mines in, the, in uh, North America there. And that accident, in my view, in part was caused by an effort to get out some of the remaining coal in a hazardous fashion. So Google Rutledge and watch his lecture. Here's why I think we're going to solve the climate problem. It's going to dawn on us, if it's not already dawning, that all of these problems are one national security, the trade deficit, the plummeting dollar, 
climate change and prosperity. We are faced, we're faced with a calamity if we don't get real about energy policy and not dumb energy policy, but intelligent energy policy. Energy is an IQ test Americans have tended to fail. And if we want to preserve prosperity, I don't think we can fail it much longer. You have been obsessing about pollution. I want to spin this discussion another direction. The most important thing to understand about energy is that energy is the original currency, not the dollar, not gold, not the euro, not the Japanese yen, but energy and other natural resources, which include fertile soil and in our part of the world, fresh water. The second thing to understand is that life is an energy contest. People say we don't have an energy policy in the U.S. I'd say, well, we do have an energy policy. It's not maybe what you would like it to be. You can have a full tank or an empty wallet. Um, I think when you read the paper, you're seeing the beginning of a century of resource nationalism. Just read the paper. It's a century that's going to be characterized by the rapid depletion of the world's giant oil fields. This is Prudhoe Bay. It peaked in 1977. In that period of time, one in 10 gallons of gasoline you put in your car came from Prudhoe. 85% of all the oil in Prudhoe Bay is now gone. The largest oil field we have found anywhere onshore in the US in the last 25 years would only fill two of these boxes. This is true of oil fields in Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Norway, the United Kingdom, all over the world. Many large giant oil fields have a production profile similar to that. Global oil production is likely to peak. When is the Maya calendar say we're doomed? 2012? Yeah, 2012 is a good, you know, rough, it may be peaking right now. But by 2012, global oil exports will have flattened. Global oil production will have flattened, and then we're not going to see an eightfold expansion in global oil supplies. No, global oil is going to go down. Global natural gas supplies are probably likely to peak by 2030. This is what you see in the paper. Is it a question that OPEC won't raise its output, or a question that they can't? An increasing number of astute observers believe that very few of the OPEC nations any longer have any ability to increase supply. The exceptions are Angola, Iraq, if Iraq ever becomes peaceful and stable, and perhaps the Saudis. In the meantime, oil demand all over the world is exploding. China was a net oil exporter in the early 90s. Their oil imports may equal ours relatively soon. The explosion of cars in China is a phenomenal thing to read about. And I think it's important to understand this thing we call the car. Cars now consume four times more energy in the form of fuel than all of the human beings on the planet do in the form of food. This is why it's a dangerous thing to turn food into fuel, as we are now doing with corn ethanol. So lots of brilliant scientists at all the great universities in, in the country are wrestling with this idea. You can go online, you can see guys at Caltech and Harvard, and you've heard some of them. People talking about how do, how do, you, how do you resolve this tension that I've outlaid. This guy, Rick Smalley, won a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on nanotechnology. He spent the last three years of his life saying, we need to find a new oil. He argued that if you solve the energy problem, all of these other problems fall into place. If you don't solve the energy problem, all of these other problems become very, very difficult. Smalley recognized some key things. 
And these are good news with respect to the climate problem. He recognized that the energy cost of conventional fossil fuels, the cost of going out and getting it and bringing it back, is going way up. This is a billion dollar platform BP went, built to go out in the Gulf of Mexico and get about a billion dollars, I'm sorry, a billion barrels of oil out of the deep water Gulf. This thing has 100 megawatts of electricity generation capacity on board. It's got enough power output, in other words, to run St. George. It just shows you the scale of what it's taking now to feed our energy appetite. In the 1930s, when we went looking for oil, we could spend one barrel of oil's energy and we could get 100 barrels back. By 1970, it had fallen to 25 to 1. It's now maybe 10 to 1, 12 to 1. And look at some of these other things we talk about. Canadian tar sands, 3 to 1. Coal liquefaction, 1 to 2. Wind, 30 to 1, which is why we did $9 billion worth of wind last year. PV right now, 8 to 1, but the thin film might be 15 or 20 to 1. Corn ethanol, 1.6 to 1 which is a way of, so corn ethanol fundamentally is not doing anything to power the civilization right now. It's enriching farmers, uh, it's impoverishing poor people in other places, but it's not really doing anything for us. This is my final eye exam. It's another chart I encourage you to go look at. I'm not going to walk you through it, but I want to make a couple of points here. This is energy return on the left axis and how much energy these things supply on the right. Energy policy in this country has to surrender to physics. It's been dominated by politics and tax breaks. We have to now do things if we want to pass the IQ test that makes sense thermodynamically. Let me give you an example. Wind is here. It has a 30 to 41 energy return. The question is, can you scale wind? So it's providing a lot of energy to you. Most of the things we're talking about right now, ethanol, hydrogen, tar sands, oil, shale, they're down in this corner. And the guy that put this chart together asked this question embedded in it. He said, what is the minimum energy return you need to run a civilization? No one knows. I suspect an advanced civilization like ours, you need 10 to 1, 15 to 1, in that range. Now, we have a hunger in this country for panaceas. We want a pill to cure balding. Uh, we want thinner thighs in 30 days. We want a magic diet. We've brought the same kind of thinking, naive, childlike thinking, Peter Pan-like thinking, to our energy challenges. Ethanol is a good example. We spent 10 years debating what role hydrogen would play in future energy systems without understanding that hydrogen is just a storage medium, like a AAA battery or the grid. Shell has spent $200 million to produce 2,000 barrels of shale oil in my part of western Colorado. They're considering heating the ground to a depth of 2,000 feet to a temperature of 750 degrees for four years. They're thinking about building a $5 billion power plant, the largest in Colorado history to do it. All of this would be dedicated to a single oil shell operation. This would be throwing good energy, coal and natural gas, at bad energy, oil shale. If you graph the energy content of fuels, you get a graph like this. And you see that oil shale has the energy density per ton of baked potatoes. <laughs> There's three times more energy in a ton of cattle manure than there is in a ton of oil shale. Oil shale has one third the energy density of Captain Crunch. <laughs> So if we want to heed thermodynamics, if we want to survive and pass the IQ test, we need to do things now that really make sense, that have high energy return and that we can scale, that we can do a lot of. 
Wind, you heard a presentation yesterday to do 20% wind. We're going to be planting these things like they were trees. Doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat, it just makes sense from an energy standpoint. We're going to build the transmission, we'll have to. Within 10 years, peak oil is going to T-bone climate change off the front page, and there we'll have a flip-flop. This country is going to be panicked about the energy basis of its survival. The January issue of Scientific American um, had an interesting article about solar energy. Uh, Chuck talked about this earlier. You know, it talked, this was an incredibly ambitious plan. It said by 2050, we could get 70% uh, of the U.S. electricity and about 40% of all U.S. energy from solar power at energy returns probably 10 to 1, 15 to 1 in that range where we can run an efficient civilization. But what would it take? And this goes back to the scale of our energy appetite, how many people we now have on board the space shuttle. You would have to build 100 of these a month. That article in Scientific American proposed covering an area about half the size of Utah, scattered in Nevada, California, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado, New Mexico but about 40,000 square miles with solar collectors. You would have to do 700 square miles a year, or 100 of these a month. A final few slides. I commend the organizers. I think this question of climate change is absolutely fascinating. I think it has huge moral and ethical element to it. A typical baby boomer will put a million pounds of this gas into the atmosphere and never think twice about it. You know, Thomas Jefferson, you read the Declaration of Independence, this wonderful prose. And then you think, well, Jefferson had slaves. He owned dozens of slaves. He was sleeping with slaves. I, I don't know what the greater sin is here ethically, but, uh, <laughs> but, but you have to think about climate change. But the big challenge we face is how you fly this amazing civilization that's the home to all of our dreams and hopes and aspirations, how you fly that to 2100. And the truth is, no one really knows. When the Wright brothers first went to Kitty Hawk, they took these little kites down there. They were about 20 feet long. They performed abysmally. They had taken the wing shape out of a textbook. The wing shape in the textbook was wrong. And so that winter, they went back to Dayton. And upstairs in the bike shop, they built a wind tunnel, this thing you see on the left. And inside the wing tunnel, they built an analog computer. And look at this thing. It's designed to measure lift. They were looking for a wing shape that would have more lift and less drag. It would be more efficient. It would unlock the fourth dimension. Now look at this thing. This measuring device is built out of used hacksaw blades and broken bicycle spokes. And that winter they tested 100 different wing shapes. They had been observing hawks and eagles and seagulls. And they, checked, they tested long, narrow wings and short, stubby, fat wings and wings with a big arch. And at the end of that winter, they had a winner. They had a wing shape that would unlock the fourth dimension. And this is it. And when you get on a plane today, whether it's a Boeing or an Airbus, you're flying on a wing that was invented upstairs in a bike shop in Dayton, Ohio, a hundred years ago. We call this Yankee ingenuity, and we're going to need every ounce of it and every ounce of honesty and engineering and courage and dedication to solving our energy problems, including climate change, in the years ahead. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it.
hope our speakers are available during the break, too, in case we don't get to everyone's question. But I think we'll have time for approximately two questions. So Stevan has a microphone. Um, if you want to take that, and I'll look for the second. Everyone in this room agrees with everything you've said. It's impressive. But we don't see any of that sentiment and conviction coming out of either the executive or legislative branch of our government. Well, I have a lot of politicians in my family. And uh, <laughs> we joke about this being a recessive gene. But um, <laughs> I mean, uh, seriously, I want an issue a blanket apology, at least from the Udalls. Um, you know, energy policy in this country has been stuck on stupid for a long time. And it's been bipartisan. I don't want to, and the Democrats maybe a little better, but it's really been bipartisan. And I'm not sure what it's going to take, um, but something's going to happen. I thought maybe a couple of wars would, you know, help it, or Katrina, or, you know, what is it going to take? $100 oil, I mean, what is it going to take? The political system is finally moving. We passed bills to do more with biofuels, to increase fuel efficiency. I think it's beginning to sink in that we face grievous challenges. You do in your household budgets, at work, but we face big challenges. And sooner or later, I don't know if it's McCain, Hillary, Barack, I don't know who it is, but every so often in the U.S. when we need a great president, we get one. And I just have my fingers crossed that whoever wins in November can be a great president. Because not just on energy, for a bunch of reasons, we need one. Let's do one more question, and then I think we need to. Let me continue on that theme. Uh, we've all been excited and, and, and fatigued by the presidential campaigns the last year. Uh, but I think we realize that statements made by one candidate have a timing uh, factor in them, and they have to be answered by the other candidate in nanoseconds, or else they take on some permanence. Uh, your speech was inspirational, and I don't know whether you came here as a politician, a prophet, or a scientist, but I think you're probably all three. And you're also a Utah, and we claim you. Uh, thank you. Uh, but I wonder if we aren't failing in response time to craziness. Namely, a thousand good people can gather, a thousand good scientists can gather and, and arrive at reasonable data. And one scientist can pop up his voice, claim he was president of Rockefeller University, for instance, and he was, uh, and say how good CO2 is for us all and all the rest is nonsense. And we all rebut him, but we're not politicians. And it seems to me there ought to be some mechanism developed where without stifling free speech or the right of free publication, we can identify those publications that are supported. Well, where, where are they supported? Are they supported by oil interests for 25 or 100 years? That is narrow-minded oil interests so, or not. So, uh, so let me... Let yeah. me just say, it seems to me we need a truth squad, something that would set up and say immediately when someone says something crazy, uh, would be willing to say no, because otherwise our politicians have no basis for decision making. This is one reason I think that climate change as a framework is not going to drive U.S. energy policy. You have one in five people in this country and a larger percentage of Republicans that don't believe human beings are causing climate change. You also have one in five people in this country that, don't, that think that the sun revolves around the earth. Um, so this may be as good as it gets on a consensus. Um, we're kind of down to the dead enders now. Um, but to do the kind of dramatic energy transformation that we need to do, it needs to be wholly bipartisan. Because to be effective, energy policy must be enduring. And to be enduring, it must be bipartisan. And the more powerful framework, in my view, and actually the more honest framework, is that 
If we want to preserve prosperity in this country, we need to do some really savvy things now, smart things. And we need to do them with diligence and courage and big money behind them. And I'm hopeful in November we will elect someone that can lead us down that path. But if we don't, we've got to do it. We've got to lead in every way we can think of. Thanks so much for your time.